you. Welcome from our side, it's from my side, Jan Hanf and Frau Thielemann, who is the head of the international office from Geisenheim University. In the moment, we are here in the kind of a small delegation tour around mainly Tbilisi, but also tomorrow we are going to the wine growing regions. And we are engaged in an exchange program in the, in the broader context of wine, wine economics. And I myself, I'm an agriculture economist from my education. And in the moment, I'm the chair in Geisenheim University, a specialized university on wine and horticulture. And I have the chair of international marketing management with special focus on wine. Maybe a few words before we start. It's kind of, you see, this is our nice logo. Um, and my contact address, if some questions arise. A few words about our institution. Geisenheim University is an institution that has been founded in 1872 as a Prussian research and education center for viticulture and pomology. So at that time, the horticultural part was more or more focused. Nowadays, we broadened it a bit. But in the end, over 100, roughly 150 years, we stayed in this strand of very specialized and applied research and teaching. Since now three years, we are granted a full university. We were coming from the more research center approach and having at the same time an applied university in Geisenheim. But then three years ago, the government decided that the best model fitted was kind of a modern new type of university with our own PhD granting rights. I emphasize so much the part of the application because still this is our mantra. We know that good research is being conducted all over the world. But what is very often missing is the linkage to the practice or the practice to the application side. And that is, I would say, our key competence. It is both on the research area, but also in our different specialized bachelor and master programs as well in our PhD. And as you said, for us in the economic center, it is the key question whether market entry pays off or not. And what do you think when you think about wine? Very often, the first idea that comes up to your mind are these extremely high price products. Everybody adores things. I would like to buy it and you can earn millions with it. But does the reality look like that? And a very simple answer is no. It's quite different. If you think about the world wine production, the first sites are quite good because I know you're all economists and you know that in the end for having a market equilibrium, market supply and market demand should match. And particularly in the case if we would have an over demand, producers would prosper. That might not be the best for welfare, but for producer side, we would find the best solution in a moment when we have an over demand or a demand surplus. So in the first moment, when you look at the picture, you see over the last 20 years, the global world wine production, roughly 270 million hectoliters, is a little bit decreasing. So in the end, first it looks quite nice because we have a downsloping production, total production curve. But how does the, cons oops, now I have to put in the right, how does the consumption look? It's quite stable over time. The problem is it's stable, but with 240 million hectoliters. What does that mean? For economists, it's a very simple question, right? When we have 270 million hectoliters production and 240 million consumption, what does that mean? Over, or is demand surplus? No. Oversupply. Oversupply. And what is? The answer to oversupply, what is the normal reaction? Price, Price decrease. Yeah. So we face here a situation that for a const or for a quite a long level time, 
we had an overproduction and particularly in the last two, three years, what we see, and that are still forecast because you know on aggregated level to really collect the real data is not that simple, but all forecasts show consumption stays stable with roughly 240 million hectoliters, production increases. Where do you think the highest production increase is occurring? China. China. Okay, just to make you an idea, I know that Georgia wants and is exporting a bit to China, but how much or how large do you think is the consumption percentage of domestic wines in China? Does China produce wine? You said already yes, but is it more importing or more, more producing it domestically? 90% of the wines are being produced domestically. Okay. How does the production structure in China look like? If you look down or back roughly five years ago, we were down with about 70,000 hectares of production or vineyards in production. Today we talk about 120,000 hectares. If you talk about grape production overall, that would include raisin production and table grape production, we even face steeper increase. Five years ago, we talk about 570,000 hectares. Today, 800,000 hectares. Second largest grape producer in the world. Second largest? Second largest. All others are decreasing. China is increasing. So just a little bit you know about production, maybe on wine. New vineyards are not producing in quantity-wise and quality-wise so much wine. So when we just see that they are recently planted, even without a single further vineyard, we can assume that China will produce in the upcoming years more on quantity side and on quality side and better wines. So it's adding a bit on the competition side. And at the same time, where do you think the most wine is bought? I think that is a hard question for Georgians. No, no, not how much, but kind of really, where do you think people buy wine? France, France yes, but in which distribution channel? I'm coming from the, from the marketing side. What do you think? I know that in Georgia, everybody... Okay, internet market, that would be one. It could also be first, always direct or indirect surely indirect, and it's the main is food retail, retail. okay? Re there's difference, like we have specialized retail mm -hmm. shops and we have food retail. And the nice bottles of wine you normally think about, the ones that cost quite a fortune or not a fortune, but which are not very nice in taste, you buy in a specialized store. If you go to a food retail shop, like you have here Carrefour, we saw it. You might have heard of in Germany about Aldi, our discount chain. These are the outlets where the most wine is being sold. The problem is they demand quite high quality. So if we talk about wine, take quality out of the equation. That is a given characteristic. I don't know. I think you're an industrial can economist. You, you you we will come to that later. I, I think understand what you're saying. Say, normally when I talk to producers, mm -hmm. if I would ask what is wine consumption is about, mm -hmm. if you want to sell more wine, the normal answer that I receive is better quality. Mm -hmm. the, real, the real answer would be, or the reality is, Quality is a given characteristic. You have to have good quality in order to sell mm -hmm. because competition is so high. Mm -hmm. So then we reduce it to price. Mm -hmm. Or, if you think about a little bit Porter, other means of differentiation. Mm -hmm. But quality is no longer a means of differentiation. Mm -hmm. In a market that has an oversupply, 
And that's why I use for the introductional part now quite a bit that you understand that if we talk about the global wine market, we talk about wines that have a very high quality, even if we, particularly if we go into the US market, the Western European market, even in food retail, we talk about quite good quality that is demanded. If you don't have it, you are not able to supply. And that is just an implication you see from the overproduction. Another part is, and I just want to highlight it with one slide, um, you know we have on the one hand bulk wine, bulk wine that is sold in larger quantities, and then estate bottled wine. And again, it shows a bit that the estate bottled wine that normally represents a bit, little bit better quality is a little bit decreasing, whereas the bulk wine is increasing. But that is not due to quality. It is due to a change of drinking habits. What have you all learned? Drink red wine a little bit aged. If you go nowadays to a food retail shop, no, you will not find aged red wine. Should you buy it, store it somewhere and wait for five years? Never ever. They are produced that you can consume them when you open them and when you buy them. It's a new trend. People don't want to wait. Or, with other words, if you live in a flat, and I have a very, very nice wife who has a lot of understanding that her husband is collecting wine. But at a certain stage, she says, no, wine bottles are not a nice accessoire for our living room. So storage is getting scarce when we talk about flats. So people want to buy a wine that is, you do not have to store. It has to be drinkable quality right when you buy it. And that is what you have to think again when we talk about wine consumption. Only a very, very small friction of wine is being sold to specialized wine retailers, to wine lovers, that's maybe 1%, who are willing to pay a lot for wine and who wants to store it and maybe even have the capability to store it. Wine storage is not that simple. So it is a very tricky market. And when we have an oversupply, it is quite price driven. No, let's see that. So, just have to look at here. So we have a face a high level of competition. And in that sense, and you must know, I think you mentioned it in your introduction of words, Western European markets is kind of one of the main markets of interest for a lot of wine producing countries. Why? Because even though we are producing a lot of wine in the southern part of Europe, Western Europe, we are also importing a lot of wine, particularly in the parts where wine is not produced. And therefore, I will reduce a bit the question that we're going to discuss, not to answer, because you are the Georgians who can maybe help us to find a solution. I can just show you some development is whether the German market, and it is the largest importing market for wines worldwide, is attractive or not, particularly for a wine producing country such as Georgia. Just giving a small remark before we start to look some of the figures and some introduction remark or some facts about the German wine market. Um, I was asked to do a market entry study for the Azerbaijani wine. We're in the moment having a partnership with an Armenian university. I think you might know the eye care and the ATC program there with Vatan and so. And they have now a wine program. Why? Because all of the Caucasian countries think and argue that they are the cradle of wine. And that should be a nice argument for differentiation. And then we can think about, is there a big difference? What can be promoted? And 
all of them would like to enter the Western European market, particularly the German one as one of the largest markets in the world. And with every producer that I'm talking to, they tell me the German or Germany is a rich country. They should be able to pay wines that are a little bit more expensive. So we will have to look whether the Germans are really willing to pay more for wine. And then we will discuss maybe quality or other attributes could help us. Um, just for the ones who do not know, I just also want to say that on the one hand we do talk a little bit lighter on, on imports, but also we do produce in Germany our own wine. And that is also rivaling because just kind of short information on, we have a very stable wine consumption. Since the last 24, 20 years, we consume 20 liters of still wine per capita and four liters of sparkling wine per capita. But what does that mean if we have a stable consumption, if there's somebody new in the market selling more wine? It means that somebody else is not selling any longer wine. Because each bottle that is sold more, somebody else is selling less. And in Germany, in the moment, a lot of people, or at least in the higher price segment, we see that some more German wine is being sold. So again, we have to think about what happens there. Just as a few remarks, where are our wine producing regions? They are in the southern part mainly. This is kind of, we are here in the Rheingau. This is the Rheingau region, which is near to Frankfurt, Wiesbaden, and then more or less south of um, Wiesbaden, Frankfurt area, the main wine growing regions start. Just to give you a small impression, Rhein-Hessia is our largest with 26,000 hectares. In total, we have 102,000 hectares. How much wine is being on how many acres or hectares? Or what is the wine producing area in Georgia? How, how large you are? Yes, yes. Roughly. I actually don't know the figure. No, yeah, I don't know. I think but but would be a, a small fraction of it. It's about 30 something. 30 something. It has been in the Soviet high times before Gorbachev and the anti alcohol policy started with about 65,000 hectares. So now we talk about roughly. 35, 40,000 hectares, so that would be Rheinhessen and Baden together. How large do you think is the production area in Bordeaux? One small, or one, not small, one wine growing region in France. You just guess it. 50, no, 112,000 hectares. 112,000, that means just the full size of Bordeaux is more than the full size of the German wine production and the German wine production is roughly three times more than Georgia. But you compete maybe in the market for red wines with Bordeaux. And particularly if we talk about wines over 10 euros in the German wine retail, you compete with Bordeaux, 112,000 hectares. And that might be also important if you think about needed quantity. And you know also about economies of scale, that has also something to do with prices. Just with a few words about our, that you have an idea from Germany where we, what we are producing. We are a mainly wine, white, white, white wine producing country. And I guess, I hope you know that when you talk about Germany, you talk about Riesling. That is our signature grape variety. And as you see, it is, we have overall roughly 23,000 hectares, and that is worldwide the number one. And that's where we are very proud of. A different story is maybe when we look for other grape varietals, such as Pinot Noir in German. It is called Spätburgunder, but it is the grape variety of Pinot Noir. It is one of the booming 
varieties in the moment in the worldwide. And there we have it's kind of the largest red variety in Germany again, with roughly 12,000 hectares. Even though it is roughly half of the size of Riesling, it is still is about, the, well, it's the third largest area under vine of Pinot Noir vines worldwide. Even larger than Italy, New Zealand, Australia, etc. And that is something that we are very proud of. And you look for Pinot Gris, you look for Pinot Blanc, it is the same story. In Germany, we are the third largest producers of the Pinots. And this is important as Pinots, Pinot Blanc, Pinot Gris, Pinot Noir, they are the grape varieties that are being more asked for. And that also indicates the ones who know a bit Pinot or the wines, they know that these are a little bit more elegant wines. They are not so, or they are not growing so well in very hot and dry areas where you have to irrigate, and then you get these kind of typical New World wines that have this broad shoulders, rich in taste, etc., full-bodied. They are quite different. But they are increasing, the typical New World style is decreasing. They have a huge problem with too much alcohol, etc. So we are lucky, but again, then afterwards we might discuss what is the grape style, production style you have here in Georgia. How does that come up and mix to that. Just a few words what I wanted to show. It's when we talk about the German market, we were talking about the production side. Okay? On the one hand, what you could see in the comparison before, it's a little bit small, but just you have to, therefore you trust, have to trust me, that the number of cooperatives the vineyards, but also the members have decreased, that structural change, that the number of wine estates change, they decrease, and the single wine estate is getting larger. But we still talk in Germany about the average size of a wine estate of five hectares. Okay, we are still very small scale. We are not talking about large scale production, it is rather small scale. We have very, very large, the largest German single wine estate has 300 hectares. If we look for some of the Georgian, they are larger. In average, it's more or less the same, but on, you have a larger um, difference between the largest and the smallest ones. What we have to take into account, and that is very important when we talk about this is the German side. We produce in an annual production of about nine point, between eight and nine million hectoliters. However, we do export a bit. We do destillate a bit. So roughly 7.5, 7.4 million hectoliters are entering the German consumer market. The vast, vast majority of wines that are being drunk in Germany, they are imported. We talk about roughly 16 to 17 million of hectoliters that are imported every year. Percentage is about 35% of German wine that is being consumed in Germany, 65% are imported. Particularly West Southern Europe, but increasingly the new world. What we do have, and this is increasing, we do re-export. That means that wines are being brought to Germany, bottled, better to say filled in bag and boxes, and then being transported to Scandinavia, to the monopole countries. Again, and that is very important, if you talk about exports, you have to play the game that the retailers are asking you for. And more and more of the large-scale retailers and the monopoles in the northern countries, they demand that the wines are being bottled either in Germany or in um, UK. So you bring bulk and you bottle it in Germany? Yes. Because... You don't know about the monopoles, so maybe you can say in a sentence because... Okay. But you know monopoles. I, I know the yeah, but, situation, but, yeah, but okay, but you know what a monopole is and a monopsone is. So whereas in Germany we have a very unregulated market, you have 
the food retailers are buying the wines from the importers or directly from the producers. In the northern countries, and that is um, Norway, Sweden, Finland and Iceland, they have a monopole where, which is buying all the wine. And they are also a monopson selling the wine towards the end consumer. So all wines that you want to sell to end consumers in those countries, you have to sell wire this state-owned retail company. What is the effect? Prices are quite high. But service is terrific. They love it. If you ask people in the northern countries, they are very, very satisfied with this monopoles, which might be for interesting as a case study because we normally assume that monopoles have rather is a negative impact on consumers. But they really love it because they have a tremendous good service and they make a very good pre-selection on quality wise. But it is a typical monopole, they have tenders, they have very strict regulations what you can uh, produce and in the end they decide, again, this kind of quality is set, even the value it is set where it is being produced and it is a pure price-based competition in order to get into the store. Okay, it's a totally different story to Germany, we have more or less no regulations and we have kind of a, really a free market in the German wine retail. Um, so the re-exports are very, very important in that sense because if you compare the re-export with the exports, we have roughly 3 million hectoliters of re-exports and only 1.5 million hectoliters of expo exports of German wines. But, and that is kind of one thing that you have to notice, now I was wrong with it, 31% of German wines that have been drunk in Germany. Two years before, it was 35%. Two years before, that was 2010, we still had 37%. It is decreasing. So we do need in the German market the exports because we cannot sell them on the local market. So again, what I said before, each bottle you sell more as one producer, another producer has to sell less. What is the um, effect? We will see later that we have very, very low prices and quite decent qualities in the market. Just again, kind of that is 2010 value chain, kind of about where are the how is the distribution organized? And we see it, small changes, quite significant changes to 2014, four years later. We have, and that is an exception when you think about other commodities or agricultural products, we do have a significant share of direct sales. You know what direct sales is? That a wine producer is selling directly to the end consumer, meaning that all the market, Ups are being kept by the producer, so a very, very profitable way to sell. But what we see is that it has decreased over time, quite rapidly. And what we see is that particularly discount, the discount change, have increased their market share. Do you know what a discount chain is? think yes then I don't need but I know I, but maybe it's kind of it's an no 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 it's a difference they normally don't work so much with discounts it is rather that they have like um, the low price all time because they buy in in large quantities they have a reduced assortment but they have a very high turnover and they started kind of really as being rock bottom kind of quality sellers. And it was kind of when they started in the 1950s, 1960s, people were thinking you go to Aldi or Lidl because you could not afford to, afford to buy 
better quality. But they were so successful, now they are the largest chains, chains food chains in the German market, um, that they have an extreme uptrade in quality-wise. In the 1990s, we were discussing the phenomena of the Porsche driving Aldi, which is the leading discounter, customer. Nowadays, it is the normal side. Everybody is buying there. Not at all. And not a phenomena. It is just a normal perception. It is normal. And they are still very price aggressive and they buy in large amounts of qu um, quantity and therefore they set the rules of the game. And they demand quite high quality. Just for an example, there's a rating from the German um, Agriculture Producer Union, DLG, and they have a scale of five points. Five is the best, one is the lowest you need at, in order to bring it into the sales. You have, do need to have 1.5 points. The best are five points. The average wine that Aldi sells has 3.2 points. They demand at least to have three points. So way above the average, mm -hmm. way above the lowest level of wines bringing into the sales. So we talk here about quite high quality wines. What do you, and we talk about wines that cost a bot, uh, one euro eighty, one euro ninety per bottle. Okay, that's a different story. But we have very good qual or good quality. So discount, and that is particularly Aldi, but Lidl is the second largest German wine retailer. Specialized retail, we discussed it before. It's a totally different story. These are smaller scale companies that are active in the upper quality segment. Wines that are much more for wine special or for wine lovers, people who are really in wines, or if you, go, if you are invited and you might not be so knowledgeable about wine and you want to make a secure bet, you go here and you buy there normally a Bordeaux because everybody recognizes it's a good wine and it's cost at least a bit. So normally when you have the, your 40th birthday, 50th birthday, for male you don't receive um, chocolates or flowers. Normally you receive a lot of bottles of wine and you can have a good bet that they will cost around 20 euros bought in a specialized retail store and most of them are Bordeaux because that's kind of you show that's kind of the price range. But what happened? And this is kind of just this blue line here. This is volume and that is value. First, just have a look on the volume. Direct sales directly from farmers to end consumers is decreasing quite sharply. And that is 2012. Before we were very stable, suddenly it dropped. Who was gaining here? Specialized wine retail. And suddenly you see people really realize we can go to the specialized retailer and we get their good produce. We don't need to drive somewhere. Also, alcohol laws get tightened a bit. What happened here, if you look more for the mass markets, this yellow, this upper line, is discount. And the other one are traditional food retail, supermarkets, hypermarkets. They lose hypermarkets, supermarkets, discount is gaining quite tremendously. That's on volume wise. Everybody could say, yes, that's what we expect. But what is much more dramatic for some of the formats is the value development. Again, direct sales is losing market share. Specialized retail is gaining. Traditional supermarkets and hypermarkets, they are losing value wise and discount is gaining. That is what happened in other food, food categories, that discount is being accepted as a very good quality for value seller is now being totally accepted in the wine market. They have a lot of wines that have, you might know, Parker points. Again, they only sell with Aldi wines that have at least 88 Parker points. 
1992 is not uncommon for a wine for six euros. And that is a tremendous discussion or for the consumer, why should I then go to the hypermarket and buy their wines? And it, in the moment, it really changes our German market. And it is very much the same development in the UK, in, um, in Netherlands, in the northern European consumer markets that are not monopolistic. Just kind of the largest food retailers you saw, it's kind of they are quite large. The largest is about 35 billion euros. Just a note on the specialized retail. These are the outlets where you would go to find a very special wine. And traditional specialized retailers, they were single owned by one owner who had one or two outlets, maximum. The problem is, these typical specialized retail stores, they are decreasing quite rapidly, and new formats are emerging. And these are food or specialized retail chains. Particularly, we have that is called Jacques Wein Depot. They are now in the market for 40 years, starting there from the scratch now having roughly 280 outlets. I think it's two years old data, now they have 288. And then we have some smaller from Fass and there are others, they are all increasing. But what does that mean? Suddenly they start the same. They have central procurement. If you go to Jacques Wine Depot, they have, if you are in the standard range, in the standard assortment, they demand from you 80,000 bottles of wine. You have to deliver them to their warehouses. They are not storing them. So they want to have continuous rep um, f um, distribution. 80,000 is also what Aldi demands for a promotion. Surely, normally they have, want to have a little, a little bit larger amounts. But you see, again, quantity is a very important um, point. And when we talk about Georgia, we have to discuss 35,000 hectares. Who's able to produce it? Are you are able to kind of deliver on a constant basis, etc.? That is very important. Um, you know the concept, that's what's kind of the outline of the German market. Remember, I didn't mention it just like that. Um, the average price in Germany for a liter of wine what do you think is the average price that the consumer has to pay over all different distribution channels, from direct sales to specialized to discount, in average? No, for a liter, for a liter, okay? For a bottle would be 0.75, but so for a liter, or you, what, what did you say? 2.25. 2.20, yes. Yes, it's roughly um, 2.25, and that's for an average for the bottle is 1 euro 90, or was it 9, kind of 99 or 9, 89. That's the average price. And that's what you have to remember when we talk about the German market. We have very low entrance fees, okay? It's, we have no taxes, or there's 19% VAT on it. Uh, but we have no income taxes or kind of no, sorry, no levies, no um, duties, excise, etc. It's quite really very competitive market. But it is 190 in the shelf. Okay, that's what you have. And that's we have the ultra premium, ultra premium starts at about 9 euros on the shelf. What do you think is the average price Georgian wine tries to sell in Germany? 15? Yes, 12.15. What is the market share? Not existing. Market okay. share is less than 1%. Non, yes, it's kind of, you can say kind of limits to unlimited, I don't know. It's kind of 1.000.1%, something like that. Really? So much? I wouldn't, I wouldn't bet on that. 
I would assume a little bit less. It's really, re really, it's really, really low. And the prices are extremely high. And that is what we have to discuss a bit. It's kind of particularly when we think about entry barriers, et cetera, what does that mean? And again, what does it mean when we talk about a wine, bottle of wine, average about two euros, it's decent quality. Okay, decent quality. And then maybe in the end I remark a bit on my perception of some of the wines in Georgia. Um, so you know the five forces, I don't think that I have to introduce it to you, it's kind of, I like it because it's kind of a nice um, structured approach. And in the end, what I would like to highlight, because you can imagine there are some kind of points that are of importance. If you have, oh, you can't really read it, but surely and when you think about what are kind of the real ideas behind the um, five forces, like economies of scale, brand identity, you find everywhere, it's kind of very important obstacle to overcome. And so I would like to give some insights about the German market in that perception. And then I would like that you comment on that, on your perception of jo um, Georgian wines. And maybe on that sense, uh, is there really a attractiveness for Georgian wines for the German market? One of the most important things is product differentiation. As I said, quality wise, we have a very high level. Normally, the most consumers are not able any longer to sh to taste huge differences between wines. Okay, it's because we have reached a level that is quite good. So what are kind of other ways to differentiate a product? What do you normally have learned? What are typical ways to overcome the, pr the problem of a homogeneous product? Branding, okay? Branding is a typical example. Do you know a lot of wine brands in the world? You have here Carrefour, so you have, could, can have there a look. Do you think there are strong brands? Or who, which is a strong brand? Can you give a name of a strong brand? Yeah. I know one. <laughs> <laughs> but in, ge in general. Hmm? Well, and then we come next to the question, first, what is a real brand? And then I would like to ask, and that's was where I want to lead to, whether maybe Georgia or other regions are really brands. So one I think, brand I know is a, is a Bordeaux wine. Okay. That is, uh, sells at, uh, I don't know, like 10,000 euro bottle. Uh, Petrus. Uh, there's another name, the couple, the, that's considered to be top. Yeah. And I was actually reading that the, all they have is 0 0.9 hectare of land under Do this. Not. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. Yeah, it's niches, but, but what is the function of a brand? What is really a brand? What is, how would you describe a brand? What is a product that is normally homogeneous and you pay tremendous amounts more for a branded product? Apple, okay? Apple, I think, is the nicest. You know, everybody, I also use Apple, okay? I know it is much better than all other computers or smartphones or so, but we also have honestly to say a Samsung is not that bad. But we are willing somehow to pay maybe double the price for an Apple product. And what is it? Is it the quality, the function? Not really. It is something more. It is something emotional. And that is branding. And branding is not that you put somewhere a name on the product. You have also some smartphone, they have a name on it. But after half a year, half a month after the release, these products are being sold in Germany for one euro. Why? Because they are reduced to function. So there has to be an emotional cognition, recognition. You have to be emotionally addressed. And then we talk about brands. I'm from the marketing side, okay? I'm looking more than just a name on something. And then people are willing to pay more for it. But what do you need to do so? Normally, product differentiation, branding, 
goes along with very high marketing spendings. And particularly because when you want to create emotions, you don't want to apply to the rational side of your brain. It has to be the more the emotional part, right? So it is running pictures, etc. So you have to invest a lot on product promotion, visually, etc. So normally hand in hand with branding goes a very high budget for promoting. And then we can talk about products. We have some special products, like you mentioned, like Petrus, some of the very, very famous um, grand applications in France, where people are paying crazy prices. But this is a very limited market. And also there, they are now so famous that people having very emotional addresses to them. And they did build it over time, but they were very good in branding. If you think about Chopin houses, nowadays they invest millions and billions of promotion. But they are doing branding and really emotional branding for more than 200 years. If you go to Bordeaux, they do promotional branding for roughly 150 years. Porto, this port wine region, extremely engaged in historical branding, real branding, not labeling. So there is a market, but at the same time, when you mention Bordeaux, there are about 80 appellations within the Bordeaux region. And overall in France, it is appellations are regions, 400 something. If you go to Italy, 300 something. Spain, 200. Do consumer recognize it? No. What's about countries? Do people are being emotionally attached when they read a wine producing country? Is it really enough to Im provoke emotions? A little. But the most su largest success on that side was Australia. Australia, 30 years ago, produced wine, quite a large amount of wine, but they were not recognized as really good wine producing countries. When did it change? In the moment when the Olympia, the Olympics, Sydney, Sydney, Millennium, they were doing such a tremendous good job in pushing Australia as an emotion experience. And that was a, a tremendous story behind it. They used millions and billions of dollars, US, Australian dollars, to promote Australia as a country. A country where you were, had an easy living, which was easy going, which was where people wanted to go. I lived in Australia in the 1990s. When I was coming back to Germany, people said, where is Australia? What is this? That's down under. What did you do there? Nowadays, when you talk with younger people, where do you want to go? Australia. That's the country of promising. That is where you want. And you saw suddenly, in that moment, this wine sales speed it up. And that is a tremendous story. And then we come, what is the promise of Georgia? What is the promise of Armenia to Western European consumers? Is there a promise in it? Do people know where Georgia is lying? Do people know where Armenia is lying? Do they know where Azerbaijan is? Do they have good feelings about Azerbaijan? Do they have good feelings about Armenia? Do they have good feelings about Georgia? Because people will want to buy a product with good association if that should be branding. And now you even want to start with appellations, regions, to provoke you. People don't even know where Georgia is. So how should they know what, where Karetia is? It's misleading to a certain extent. Leading off the intention of maybe one main message. And you don't have a lot of seconds where people make a decision. And entry barriers is also very important. So 
this emotional branding is very, very hard. Then what is another very important point where you always discuss? It's about exit or entry barriers. And it is the amount. Who is your main customer? It is not the end consumer. It is retail. In all Western European markets, we talk about retail. If we want to produce a little bit more quantity-wise, it will always be this food retail demanding 100,000 or more bottles. So then, in the end, you only have the specialized food retail. And even they develop worldwide to more and more chain systems demanding more quantity, lower prices. And they have very, very specific demands on how wine has to be supplied. Um, and I think one could go through the different points. And in the end, we turn to a certain point that if we talk about kind of thinking going further on with the Porter's ideas of business strategies or corporate strategies, we would always lead into this part that you have to talk about focus strategies. Due to your high production costs, you do face here quite high produce, production costs. Don't be misled by your low labor costs. But the overall production and transport costs are very, very high. So you can't even think about a narrow market segment and a focus strategy on low costs, which other countries can do, like Chile to a certain extent, you do have to go for differentiation. And there the big question for me is, and really being asked for all three different countries, Azerbaijan, Georgia and Armenia, all of you want to go into the same markets with the same arguments. We were, during Soviet time, very well known for wine production, we are all the cradle of wine, we all produce wine in high mountainous regions, and we are Caucasian, or you don't want to be all, we are kind of, we are the Caucasian wine producer. And they enter all the same moment in the same market. You even are in your niche, again, very price driving because you have the same homogeneous arguments why to buy these wines. You go and have very similar marketing strategies, pushing tradition, tradition, tradition. Everything is oh, young, which is not about six or 8,000 years old. But all of you have the same tradition. If you think about Israel, they also say they have a 6,000 year old tradition. If you go to Lebanon, they have also 6,000 years old tradition. Luckily, in the moment, Iran is not producing wine because they have, I think, the latest found was the 8,500 years of grapes. They are now still on the safe side because they are not allowed to produce wine, so that's not a danger. But in the end, this is this kind of the crescent where all of the fertility started and therefore the wine production started. So for me, the big question is why to go there by yourself? I think from a marketing perspective, the natural approach should be a Caucasian approach. You have a lot, lot of richness around, very interesting, different parts in the Caucasia area. However, you have a lot of shared. And for a communication to end consumer, the shared, is, the shared part is larger than the individual parts. And that is Caucasia, and the whole Caucasus is quite known in the consumer's mind. And therefore, I would rather always think about why not think about more on a larger pan-regional approach than always on your own small piece of the Caucasus. I know it's very hard, but I'm working on at least a joint I want to take some of my students from Geisenheim to an excursion, at least to Georgia and Armenia, and maybe somehow I will be able to do somehow Azerbaijan as well. I will see. But coming to a kind of a small conclusion, we have an overproduction, we have a very high competitiveness. 
If you want to sell more wine, you really have to give good reasons why to sell it. I think, I think it is more on the emotional part. Here it is really the big, big challenge how to create such a USP. I wouldn't rec recommend to go in kind of single way. And you have to be customer oriented. And customer oriented means very often in indirect channels or in indirect channels, which are the vast majority, particularly for exports. It is about retailers you have to concentrate on. And that means, and that is, I use here some pictures that a very nice co lecturer of mine showed me that was kind of, he is an own vintner by himself, owning a 10 hectare wine, winery, wine estate. And that's what he always tells my students in the module on Asia. Wine is about feelings, love, and your producers, and particularly for producers, you love your product. You love it and you think it is the best. And you think you know what is the best wine that you had ever tasted, but forget it. It is about pure markets. Consumer, and that means you need to have a clear customer orientation, a clear marketing strategy, a very good market knowledge in order to survive and in order to sell your wine. So forget about all of this vintner's romanticism and really start to get down to real strategy work and think about customers and how you can deliver an extra benefit to them. Thanks for your attention and that's my presentation.